Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Thought Leader Club podcast. For those of you who are new to the show and we haven't met yet, hello. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Cheryl Lau, and I'm the coach for aspiring thought leaders and the host of the show, the Thought Leader Club podcast. And around here, we believe that sharing your story, becoming known for your thought leadership, and building a body of work is the foundation to creating your own version of a successful life, career, and business. And to those of you who are the OGs of this show, thank you for being here as well. It's so good to see you again. So for today's episode, I want to retell my story thus far. And especially since we rebranded the podcast and our signature program not too long ago, I want to take this as an opportunity to share my story and reintroduce myself. So this is going to be a three-part series. And specifically, I want to share my journey, my career journey specifically, up until this point uh, in this particular episode. And in the next one, I want to share more about my business journey and thought leadership journey. And then the third part of the series, I'll be sharing with you my vision and plans moving forward. So here goes. So to start, I want to set the stage by sharing a bit more about how I operate and think. So when I thought about what are some of the core guiding principles that influence how I see the world or make decisions, I was able to distill it down to the following three. Number one. I believe in creating your own definition of success. And I specifically see this from three angles. So number one is that sometimes creating a life, career, or business that you're proud of is not what others expect or want from you. And this means that you have to stand firm when pursuing what you truly believe in and always take full responsibility for your decisions and actions. And number two, it is okay If people don't support you in the beginning, stay committed to your vision and to your goals. And number three, ultimately, creating your dream life, career, and business is a choice that you have to make. There is no right or wrong, but just make a decision and move forward. The second guiding principle that really influences and shapes the way I view the world and think is the belief that there's always another way there are always options. And exploring alternative paths, doing things differently, and always being open to untangling how our social conditioning has shaped our thinking is, in my opinion, essential to creating a life career and business that you're truly proud of. And when we're able to approach our our work and also the world at large from different perspectives, it just opens up so many more avenues for our goals and also opportunities that we never could have imagined. And the third way that I operate or view the world is be sincere, be genuine, be kind, always. And don't just assume like you know what someone should or should not do or like make blanket judgments about someone simply based on one piece of information. There's just so much we don't know about one another. And every person has their own set of lived experiences, values, and beliefs. So be respectful and be genuinely curious about hearing their story. There's so much to learn about any single person. And there's so much more that we can learn from each other. So I wanted to start there first, which are the values that guide my worldview and also how I support my clients. So for those of you who might be new to my my work, what I do, my work is centered around helping aspiring thought leaders become known for things that matter to them. And that includes their story, their work, and how they think and view the world without the infiltration of social norms or voices telling you who you quote unquote should be. Instead, when we work together, you will receive a personalized strategy in coaching to build a body of work that positions you as an emerging thought leader, all while taking into consideration your values, your lived experiences, your capacity, and also how we can set you up for your one to three year dreams. Because Here's what's happening for so many people in the audience right now. Even though on paper, it looks like you have done everything, quote unquote, right, right? Like there's, even though you've checked off all the boxes, you've hit the metrics of success up until this point, there's always been something 
that's inside you, that's nudging you to really step it up and really make a name for yourself, but not in the traditional way that you were told. Yes, you've worked extremely hard to check off all the right boxes up until your your mid-20s, your late 20s, your early 30s, mid-30s. Yes, you've gone to the right school, you got the right GPA, you got the right jobs after graduating. Yes, you've set, you've you've set yourself up like to be on track for a stable, successful career in life for decades to come. But there's still a part of you that feels off. And now you're you're craving to show up bigger and bolder, both online and offline, in order to make a name for yourself, to confidently speak on topics that matter to you, and attract clients or opportunities from all over the world. Right. So for a lot of people, especially those of you in the audience right now, up until this point, you've spent years building your street cred. Maybe you've even gotten several degrees or you've already built up your reputation in the industry. But when you look ahead at the next one to three years, you know that there's like this next level version of you that wants to be seen and recognized. And right now on the surface, you may come off as really analytical, very put together, very accomplished, but there's still this part of you that yearns to be creative and entrepreneurial, and you deeply desire more creativity in your life and to build something that you can call your own. So I also want to make a note here and say that this version of you it sure as heck is not someone who follows those step-by-step blueprints to get clients to create a 10k month. Like you're done with being like being someone who you were told that you were supposed to be. But instead, there's this 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 version of you that's coolly confident, creative, and playful, and speaks articulately with conviction and is damn good at what you do. And you want to be recognized for this version of you, right? People are captivated by your story. They love being in your audience and hearing your perspectives and ideas. And they know that you are the person that they need to work with right now. And guess what? You're not going to need another PhD or another legit credential to make this happen. You don't need to make those humble brag posts on LinkedIn just to impress people and get them to want to work with you. There's no need to fake a certain personality just to make you more likable or palatable. You also don't need to creep on other entrepreneurs in your space and analyze their Instagram content or take notes on their podcast episodes because you don't trust what you have to say and you don't think that you have the aptitude to create good content on your own, right? But here's what I want to say. What you will need moving forward is becoming known for your unique thought leadership and building a body of work that captures that thought leadership. And thought leadership, it, it's what makes a difference between someone sitting quietly in your audience for months and months and months versus them feeling compelled right now to reach out to you and let you know how much your work has impacted them, right? Thought leadership is what sharply differentiates you from a sea of entrepreneurs who are offering the same services as you. And it's why people remember you, right? It's why people see you as someone who is thoughtful, genuine, and brilliant at your craft. Thought leadership is also precisely how you're going to sparkle and shine brightly on the internet so you stay top of mind for your audience without having to conform to what you think you're supposed to look like or sound like in order to attract opportunities. And when you're able to build a body of work that captures the essence of your unique thought leadership, You start making your one to three year dreams happen right now. But now you might be thinking, but Cheryl, why do you believe this? Like, why are you talking about this so much? Like, how did you even arrive at a point where you believe so much in the concept of thought leadership and building a body of work? Well, for those who are curious, I would now like to take you back in time and share with you my story and why the current work that I do today, why it all matters so deeply to me. Okay, so (laughs) to start off, I want to share what my younger days were like. So I was born in Tennessee, 
USA, and I spent the majority of my childhood in various cities throughout the United States and Canada. And my parents were Chinese immigrants who worked really damn hard to provide me with the resources and privileges that I had while growing up. And since young, I've internalized characteristics like work ethic, commitment, and taking ownership of your results. And I, 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 I learned these by observation of my parents, right? And I also grew up in environments that really prized traditional metrics of success and like environments that celebrated those who were in the top 1%. And another thing is that since a young age, I've been acutely aware of the privilege I have because of the hard work and sacrifices that my parents have put into their careers and just how hard they work to provide me with the life and resources I had since childhood. So what happened was that since young, I somehow like imposed this sense of guilt onto myself. And specifically, I place this sense of guilt onto myself for not doing enough for my parents. And what that looked like was this sense of guilt for not doing well enough in school, even though I literally got all A's, right? I I also had this self-imposed guilt for not being talented enough in extracurricular activities, even though my parents literally never pressured me to like, be like an athlete, right? Or this self-imposed guilt for not getting into an Ivy League university, even though I did get into really good schools like Berkeley and UCLA and ultimately decided to go to the University of Toronto. And just overall this like the sense of guilt for just not doing enough. Because what I was doing unknowingly was I was constantly comparing myself to my parents' work ethic. And I felt like I wasn't contributing enough to the family. And this thought process stemmed all the way back from childhood, like way before I became like an 18-year-old adult, right? So because I have for some reason placed this sense of guilt onto myself for not doing enough or, or not being enough as a daughter for my parents, I also develop this sort of like self-imposed need to be the best in school and in career because I equated my career success with being a good daughter, even though my parents literally never said that to me. So just like a lot of you who might be listening to this, my parents also played an influential role in the views that I hold today. And my dad in particular played the biggest role in terms of my beliefs that I hold about success and career because he is someone who really, 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 really believes in the importance of being a hard worker. And he always emphasized that, you know, even though his family were very, very poor, And he himself may not be the most talented or smartest person. He prided himself in being extremely hardworking. And he never gave up despite rejections and failures or embarrassments. And he really embodied this core value of hard work, commitment, never complaining, and never quitting. And for him, that's how he was able to persist through so many challenges in his life and career. And that's how he was able to create that income that provided me, his only child, with a very healthy and comfortable lifestyle. So because I saw how his hard work was the reason I had the the childhood I had growing up, the the concept of being a hard worker in every area of my life it, it just was so deeply imprinted in me, right? And I'd say that throughout school, like high school, my dad would also constantly perpetuate the importance of hard work. So for example, back in high school, when it was exam season, I would like sleep for like a few hours between 11 p.m. till like 3 a.m. And then I would wake up at 3 a.m. to keep studying. And, and my dad would actually support this. It's so ridiculous now looking back, but he would literally set his own alarm at 3 a.m. 
to make sure I woke up at 3 a.m. because he's, he knew I wanted to wake up at 3 a.m. And then he would even like make breakfast for me at 3 in the morning, right? Well, I guess it's not breakfast because it's like 3 a.m. But like, anyways, like the point is that he and I both had this really extreme view on no, the notion of hard work. But all that to say, like, basically, I, I really believe in the importance of hard work and persistence from a young age. So all that to say, it makes a lot of sense why I grew up to be someone who values hard work and placed a lot of pressure on myself to create success in school and in my career, because I had just always associated that as a way to give back to my parents and say, thank you for everything that they've done for me. So now let's fast forward. Like now that we've set the stage here and given you some context, I want to fast forward to my uh, early and mid twenties. Okay. So up until this point, I was pretty damn good at checking off the boxes. So whether this be the 4.0 GPA box or the get XYZ award or scholarship box, or even post sexy pictures on Instagram and get all the likes from people you don't care about box. Like I check them all off, but the honest truth is, even though I look like I had it all figured out, I was deeply depressed and unsure of who I really was. Because here's the thing, up until I graduated from university, my identity was heavily connected to my academic achievements. I mean, I've gotten a number, numerous scholarships and awards throughout my academic career up until this point and got really good grades throughout university. So honestly, my mentality, like up until the point when I graduated from university, it was really focused on what other boxes of success can I take off? What other awards and scholarship can I win? What other prestigious postgraduate program or career can I do? Right? I cared so much about my image and what like impression I was creating things like getting likes on my Instagram posts they mattered so much to me I also spent so much darn time on LinkedIn looking around at what others were doing and thinking about how I can be more successful so I too can post those humble brag posts on LinkedIn right so Basically, after graduating, I moved from Toronto to Hong Kong and started law school. And I even got this fancy $100,000 Hong Kong dollars scholarship because like being a lawyer made sense, right? Like I'll finally be successful for reals this time and finally look like I have it all, right? Well, much to the dismay of 22, I think 22-ish years old Cheryl, not only did I still feel like a total failure and fraud, I still felt so lost and empty and alone and not good enough. And it also did not help that I realized that becoming a lawyer was a completely misaligned decision. Because you see, when law school started, everything seemed fine for a few months until it was time to go do legal internships at like law firms. And I had this opportunity to do an in-house uh, internship at the legal department of a multinational hospitality slash hotel company. And it was a really great experience, except for the actual work I had to do. <laughs> like it was so much fun, except for actually doing the, the legal work, right? <laughs> So generally speaking, the work culture for in-house lawyers is way more relaxed compared to lawyers who work at traditional law firms. And, you know, as an intern, my workload was already pretty light and flexible. But even then, I still had zero interest in the work that I was doing. And I definitely was not interested by the actual work that the actual lawyers were doing. And that's when I realized, oh, I don't think I actually want to be a lawyer, right? And that's when I realized something needed to change. So during the, the summer between the first and second year of law school, I mulled over what to do. I mean, I had all these flow charts, these pros and cons tables to analyze like what were my best possible options. And the whole summer passed and second year of law school started 
And I was still so confused about what to do next. Should I stick it out and finish the three years? Should I, and then find a job that was not a lawyer job? Or should I just leave now and then find another graduate program that was a better fit? Or should I work a few years and get more experience and explore my interests? Honestly, nothing seemed like a good option at the time. But with hindsight, I can now see that that was just my ego speaking. I had many options, but of course, every option came with a certain level of um, sacrifice, but sacrifice in the sense that every option required me to get over my ego and stop doing things just to impress people, right? And if I have to summarize the, the single perspective shift that really pushed me to ultimately make a decision, it was this. If I want my situation to change, I have to change the way I felt about myself. Because this whole entire time, up until this point in my life, every single academic or career move that I had made was done out of some self-imposed need to impress people or look successful. And I realized that if I wanted to change my situation, I had to let go of my ego and stop caring about what people thought of me and also changed the relationship I had with myself. And I also had to reframe what success meant to me. So I ultimately made the decision to quit law school, right? But I think it makes a lot of sense when I say that when I quit law school, my self-concept and identity felt like it was just crumbling because I had always saw myself as someone who was a high achiever and worked really hard no matter what. And to top it all off, I felt like I disappointed my dad and my mom too, but mostly my dad because both of them just did not understand my decision to quit law school. And on top of not having their support or understanding, they said some really, really painful things to me. I mean, for one, they called me a quitter. They said I'm someone who is always just so half-hearted and not committed to what I say I would do. They also said I was ungrateful for all the resources and opportunities that I've had. And they also told me that they were very disappointed in me. And my mom even said, I had to bring harmony back into the family. Like literally just that that because I, of my decision, I had like brought like, what's the opposite word of harmony? Uh, chaos. <laughs> I had brought chaos to the family, right? And, you know, this was a really challenging time for me personally because it really led me to question everything about myself and I didn't know who I was. The identity that I had associated myself with was just, It was just collapsed and I didn't know who I was or what to do. I felt so much shame and I blamed myself for being the way that I am. I felt like I was wrong. It was all my fault and I felt so much guilt. But the conversation I first had to have with myself was, Cheryl, are you going to take responsibility for your decisions and stay committed to your goals? Even if people right now don't get it or support you. Right? Because it's not their job to agree with my, my life decisions or support my goals. It's your job, Cheryl, to always have your own back and stay committed to your goals and keep your word to yourself. No one else could do that for you and nor should they, right? If you can't even do that for yourself. So, I mean, ultimately, I made my decision to quit law school and figure it out from there. And, you know... At this particular juncture of my life, I decided that no matter what, if I decide to pursue another path that's different from the one that was expected or wanted from me, or even if literally no one was like imposing any expectations on me, I still promised myself to be okay with taking all of the responsibility over the outcomes of my decision. And at this point, I decided that even if I do end up failing and having to go back, to what I was doing or starting from square one again, even if it's really hard as I embark on this new path or whatever initiative moving forward, even if it's been five years and no one around me is supporting me, whether it be emotionally or practically, like regardless of the outcomes, I promise myself that I will always have my own back and take responsibility for the decision that I made. So let me tell you what happened after I quit law school. 
Well, again, at this point, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. I just knew that it was not becoming a lawyer. So I experimented with a lot of things, right? But ultimately, I first knew that I needed to make some money. (laughs) So I applied to a lot of research assistant jobs because I had worked as a research assistant throughout school. So I knew I could at least maybe get my foot in the door for now. But honestly, I didn't hear back from like, like, all but two applications I sent. I definitely sent over 20 applications and I only heard back from two. So I got two interviews and one of them was a no, but one of them was a yes. Um, And I think like my hypothesis is that uh, I didn't get that particular job or maybe a number of those jobs because I lacked the language skills that were necessary to conduct a research or be a research assistant, especially in Hong Kong, where the the primary language is like Chinese slash Cantonese, right? So I understood that. But basically for the one position that I did hear back from and I did get an interview and the job offer, I actually ended up working with this professor for about, I think almost two years before I started my PhD in late 2020. So long story short, I love this job so much that it actually inspired me to pursue a PhD. And I really enjoyed not just the the responsibilities that I was given, but I also had a lot of interest in the research topic and area, so much so that I even wanted to explore research as my own career, which is why I decided to apply to do a PhD later on. But more on this later. Um, during this time, I also dabbled in several other things because I was just so hungry for whatever experience I could get. I, I worked as a part-time English tutor for a local school. I did, um, I was like an assistant to this, uh, personal branding strategist slash executive coach for C-suite executives and companies in Hong Kong. Um, I also went down this rabbit hole of the online space. Right. So another so one more thing that I did start was starting my online coaching business and creating content. And because let me, let me maybe I'll backtrack it for a little bit. Because right now, as I was exploring all these opportunities, whether it be research assistant jobs or teaching English or being an assistant to a uh, executive coach here, I was starting to just become more and more aware of how I've been spending my entire life thus far just modifying myself to fit society's definition of success. And I was never really fulfilling my own potential or defining success for myself. I was just trying to squeeze myself into other people's boxes. But as I was exploring and stepping out of my comfort zone, I was yearning to find myself. So I really let my curiosity guide me through this season. So besides exploring the the real world, the 3D world, the offline world, I also was in the online space. And during this time, I started to discover content creators and entrepreneurs and thought leaders who were sharing their story, their message, and their work online. And I saw that because they had the audacity to believe in what they had to say and hence show up online, they were able to shine and impact others, including me. And so I started to build my own online presence and coaching business because others had the audacity to believe in Sparkle. Because of them, I also started to believe and sparkle myself. (laughs) So uh, during this point in my journey, I was able to find a bit more hope and courage during a time when I really didn't have much courage or hope, let alone belief in myself. So long story short, I was able to find so much comfort, so much hope, and so much help just by hearing other people's stories and experiences, especially from from the internet right and keep in mind that like i i these are people i don't know in person or or i like these are all people strangers on the internet right and it was at that point when i realized our story our lived experiences and our perspectives on the world not only does it help ourselves but it can also help other people and this is why i now believe so much in the concept of thought leadership. Because as thought leaders, we have a responsibility to show people what is possible. Our story, our thoughts, our ideas 
all of that together can help others build their own belief. And I sincerely hope that you too can see that you hold something that is not only helpful to you, but it can also help others. You too have your own unique set of thought leadership that helps people. There's people out there who will be who will be able to change their own lives because of you showing up and sharing your story, your ideas, your perspectives. Your thought leadership will play a role in some way, shape, or form in helping them hold the belief for themselves. Your thought leadership will help them see that like what they may not be able to see right now, like you're able to help them see it from a different light. Your thought leadership will be the impetus for them to take action towards their goals and dreams because you have the audacity to believe in Sparkle Others can now also have the audacity to believe and sparkle, right? So in late 2018, I started sharing little by little online and I later started my coaching business in late 2019. So I'm going to dive into this part of my journey in way more detail in the next episode of this three-part series. I'll talk about my business, side hustling, entrepreneurship, thought leadership, et cetera, but For now, I'll just share a really, really quick overview of what happened during my timeline from 2020 till 2022. So in 2020, after after burning out from my business because of 24-7 hustle and taking a complete break for seven months, I restarted my business. And instead of repeating history, I I now have developed my own approach to building my business on zero to two hours a day, even as a side hustler. So because of my uh, increased efficiency, I now had the capacity to also start a podcast, which was originally called the Side Hustle Club. And this was also the year when I transitioned from being a full-time research assistant to being a full-time PhD student. And guess what else happened in 2020? the COVID pandemic. And then in 2021, this was the year when I created my first six-figure year in business, even as a side hustler. I was also becoming known as the side hustle coach in the online space and everything looked pretty good. It looked pretty good online, right? But truthfully, I struggled offline and was starting to fall behind in my PhD because because at this point, because of the COVID pandemic, my partner and I were separated for for almost two years because we were a long distance couple for almost five years. So throughout 2020 and 2021, it was a combination of strict pandemic related re- restrictions and regulations in Hong Kong that basically made it impossible for me and my, my then boyfriend, now husband to travel and see each other, right? And, and because of it, there was also a whole year when I did not see my dad who was working overseas. So in a nutshell, I I struggled a lot emotionally because I really missed my loved ones. And my performance as a PhD student, it really dipped as a result. So in December 2021, I ultimately applied for a leave of absence for seven months just to go to Singapore and be with my partner. And... During this leave of absence from the PhD, it really hit me that at this current season of my life, my priority is 100% to be with the people who I love and who matter the most to me. And I realized that right now in this season of my life, continuing my career as a coach and entrepreneur would allow me to be there with my loved ones just because of the location and time flexibility of of this business, right? And ultimately, in April 2022, I formally quit my PhD and became a full-time entrepreneur. And I also moved in with my husband and I now have the flexibility to travel overseas and see family whenever I want it. And of course, 2022 was also the year when the COVID restrictions were loosening up and it was basically gone by the end of the year. And this this was only possible like the ability to go for a leave of absence to become a full-time entrepreneur and have this as my main career to to now be with my my husband like all of this was possible because of the body of work and business I built for the past few years what started out as a fun side hustle a, a side project if anything 
has become an actual source of income. It is a full-fledged thought leadership career. So needless to say, I will always, always, always be so grateful to the past Cheryl who had the audacity to, to believe in herself and show up every single week to build this body of work. But that said, the decision to quit my PhD, it was a decision that brought me a lot of grief. And a huge reason why this decision felt so difficult was because the PhD meant, it meant so much to me. But it wasn't necessarily the, the, the degree or the title that meant a lot. It was why I even pursued the PhD in the first place. Because actually, when I first quit law school, like years ago, at that point, I really lacked belief. I, I yes, I trusted myself to, to take responsibility, to be proactive and to work hard, but it was still really hard for me to believe that things will be okay. And the professor that I ended up working for as a research assistant, he was someone who didn't just didn't just offer me a job, which gave me money and an income and a salary, but he was someone who who I felt recognized my potential and gave me the opportunity opportunity to explore my research interests and really hone in on certain research skills. And that allowed me to over time cultivate my own belief in myself, right? Like, oh, I can actually see myself potentially being a researcher or an academic. I actually have some skills I'm really good at. I'm actually interested in research topics, right? Like th this, this whole experience working for this professor, it gave me not just a job, but the space to nurture my own sense of self-belief. And guess what this sense of self-belief did for me? Once I started creating belief in myself in a professional career setting or context, I took that belief and ran with it. Because with that growing sense of confidence, I was also able to start building my body of work to start that coaching business. I really felt like I had nothing to lose but just try just experiment, just do something out of my comfort zone. So when I actually later on decided to pursue a PhD, I only applied to one school, one department slash program, and one professor in that department. And yes, it was the exact same professor I was working for. And luckily, our research interests uh, were a match and we were able to match as supervisor, supervisee for my PhD. And I still remember, and I'm getting, I might get a little emotional. Um, I still remember when in, in 2020, I think it was maybe February of 2020, when the department gave me a phone call and told me I was accepted because I was waitlisted at first. Um, I, I cried right after hanging up the phone. And I, I, I called my boyfriend right after and I was sobbing and it was like 2 p.m. on a weekday and he was at work and he was so freaked out because he's like, what's going on? Why is, why is, my, why is my girlfriend crying? Why is she calling me out of nowhere? And I was just so overwhelmed with joy to be accepted to the program. And I just couldn't wait to, to do my own research and, and do it under the mentorship of this professor. And... Right now, like I'm, I'm choking up and tearing up as I'm recording this, even though it's been like more than a year since I've quit the PhD, it still brings up a lot for me because that's just how much it meant to me. Um, but basically, I I just had so much belief in what I would do as a PhD student, and I so did my supervisor, and we were both so excited for me to do the PhD and just. This opportunity meant so much to me. But the reality was when COVID started in March 2020, or maybe even earlier than that, I I really thought, oh yeah, this COVID thing is just going to last for a few months, whatever. And my, my boyfriend and I would still be able to fly back and forth, just like how we did before COVID started. But COVID didn't end, and it was still happening when I started my PhD in the fall of 2020. It was still happening after I I finished my first semester after the whole first year finished. And 
eventually it just got harder and harder because I haven't seen my, my, my boyfriend and family for a long time. So even though I was making a very informed decision when I accepted my PhD offer, COVID didn't pan out the way any of us had expected. So naturally, my priorities changed as a result. And fast forward to 2022, I decided that, you know, right now, being with my loved ones was the biggest priority. So I decided to prioritize that. And 2022 was a really difficult year. Um, even though on the outside looking in, I think a lot of people thought it was so cool. Like, congratulations, you you are now a full-time entrepreneur. How exciting. Like, like that was a dream for so many people. But it it was just a hard year, right? Um yeah, um, for, for most of 2022, ever since I quit my PhD, it was a really difficult year because I had just attached so much meaning to the PhD. To me, the professor that I worked for and worked with as a PhD student was not just someone who helped me recognize and believe in my own potential as a researcher, but he. the story I was telling myself was that he was one of the few people who recognized my potential during a time when it felt like no one else recognized my potential. Because when I quit law school, everyone else, it felt like everyone else just didn't understand. So as you can see, this this story I was telling myself was uh, was it was I'm sure you can now kind of feel like why it was such a difficult decision for me, and it honestly took like the rest of the year in 2022 for me to start finally accepting and recognizing that yes, although I could give so much credit to this professor to that job to the PhD, like. For, for for who I have become today, I was also now starting able to see that they played a role in my journey, but I was ultimately the one who did all the work. The professor, the job, the PhD program, they were all stepping stones for me up until this point, and I was ultimately the one who took the steps they didn't do that for me. I did that. So slowly but surely, I was starting to, ab- to to see that I created my own results. Every single result in my life, I created that. I was also able to start to unpack my own thoughts about the PhD. And I could finally, by the end of the year, I was able to see that it wasn't because of the professor or the job or the PhD that created my current results in life, career, or business, but it's myself, right? Like I was presented with opportunities and I made a decision to take up on those opportunities and give it my best to maximize my results and my growth within those opportunities. And once I could see that, oh, I did that. Like I actually, I was one who even created those opportunities and stepping stones in the first place, right? Like I cold pitched this professor years ago and then he interviewed me and I did a great job in interviewing and he gave me a job, right? Like it wasn't magically like he gave me a job offer out of nowhere, right? Like I had to create the steps to even lead to that job offer, that research assistant job offer. And it wasn't like this professor helped me start my business, but it was because I applied my newly cultivated confidence from my my career to other parts of my life that had nothing to do with the job. And that's why I started my business. So every opportunity that came my way, I made a decision to both accept the opportunity and also create results from it. And this is how I know that I will be okay with what Every decision I choose to make moving forward, right? And because I now trust myself to make decisions and stay committed to making those decisions work, I also always know that I will take full responsibility responsibility for whatever decision I make. This is who I am. This is my identity. And so this is a really nice spot for us to wrap up this episode and segue into part two of this three-part series. So 
in part two, we are going to take a look at my journey since starting my, my thought leadership journey, my body of work journey, my business journey. And we're going to look at my three years as a side hustler, growing podcasts, growing my community online, friendships, connections online, building that leadership, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And also transitioning uh, into full-time entrepreneurship. So all of that's going to be in part two of this three-part series. And then we're going to wrap up the series with a episode talking about my vision and plans for the next few years. So As a prelude for the next episode, here's how I'm going to wrap up this episode. Today, I get paid to be myself on the internet. (laughs) Well, sort of, okay? So (laughs) it took basically three years before my, my thought leadership career was making considerable income. And that's the thing. Building a career takes time. And building a career as a thought leader is no different, right? So today, I am deeply committed to helping aspiring thought leaders build a body of work that sets them up for their one to three year dreams and create opportunities that they once thought were impossible. And I cannot wait to help you do the same. Anyways, more on thought leadership, more on business, more on body of work to come in the next episode. So do stick around for that. I, I'm kind of all up in my feels right now. So I'm kind of relieved that we are at the end of the episode. I did not expect to, to tear up and choke up in this episode. Um, As I'm recording this, it is November 19th, 2023, which is like more than a year and a half since I quit my PhD. And it's, it, I'm, I'm, I'm not exactly surprised that I got emotional earlier when I talked about quitting the PhD, but I think that just shows how much it meant to me. So yeah, Um, anyways, (laughs) thank you so, 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 so much for being here and I'll see you in the next one. Sounds good? Awesome. Let's get to work. 